And let's turn to yachting and Britain's yachtsmen and women are of course very much uh, among our best hopes for medals in Sydney later on this year. Last week the Olympic trials took place in Weymouth and Richard Simmons was there. Well it's around four months to the start of the Olympic Games where out on Sydney Harbour our sailing athletes will be racing to contribute to the overall Team GBR medal hall. But before they can be fighting for places on the Olympic podium, well they first got to make the team. We're here in Portland for the Chernikiv Sailing Regatta Olympic Trials. The end of four years of dedication and the prospect of either a place in the team or the bitter disappointment of missing out. One thing's for sure, this is going to be a week of emotional highs and lows. The next 10 days is make or break for sailors who have dreamed of Olympic gold for the last four years and more. Sailing has been a major contributor to the British Medal Hall. In Atlanta in 1996, Britain won two silver medals. Ben Ainsley in the laser class and the late John Merrick and Ian Walker in the 470. Two other teams were unlucky to miss out on bronze. It was a performance that brought sailing world-class performance scheme funding and that's meant better equipment, better training and better support. This time, Team GBR sailors are looking strong prospects for an even greater medal haul. There are four types of boats in the Olympic pit lane. Single-handers, double-handers, keel boats and windsurfers. Each type of boat requires a different range of skills from a different type of sailor. Some boats are fast reaction speed machines, others reward the technical chess game. There are 11 gold medals to be won in sailing in Sydney this September. You may wonder why so many. Well, this is the reason. Just as in athletics, where a shot putter may weigh twice as much as a long distance runner, in sailing, different sized athletes require different types of machinery. You'll find a 120 kilogram bruiser keeping a keelboat upright and a 50 kilogram featherweight at the front of the women's windsurfer fleet. So, who will be going to Sydney? Well, in fact, three teams have already pre qualified by filing medal-winning positions at international regattas. Andy and Percy in the Finn class was a favourite to join them, despite illness. I'm quite confident, but I've had a lot of problems recently. I've had a bout of food poisoning when I was in Mallorca at the Europeans, which forced me to drop out of that. And uh, not long before that, a broken foot, which interrupted my training. But I think I should be all right. And the number one seeds in the men's 470, Nick Rogers and Joe Glanfield, were equally confident. I think that... Um... As going in his favour is, is no bad thing, you know, because it puts pressure on the others. They've, they've got to beat us. And it'd be great to get this out of the way and then to get on, on with the games and, um, and to really focus on that. First, they had to set their sights on number three seeds, Chris Draper and Dan Newman. Um, basically, I think that we're basically working as a team. Uh, the roles in our boat are completely shared. We're very strong psychologically and mentally, which is what we've spent a lot of time on in the last six months. And basically, I think our teamwork and our shared roles will make the difference this week between winning and losing. In the 49er class, Paul Butherton and Mo Gray were looking to put on a burst of form from their number five seed position. The big advances we've got is um, most of these guys haven't done Olympic trials before. This is my fourth. I've won Olympic trials and I've lost them. And I've only ever won the ones that I thought I was going to do before we got into it. And I think we're going to win this. So in the single-handers, Europe and Laser pre-nominated 13 entries in the fin. In the two-person, well, there are 17 470s, 17 49ers and eight tornadoes. In the keelboats, well, the stars pre-nominated, there are six solings here. And in the windsurfers, 27 Mistrals will be taking part. In the single-handed classes, two of our three sailors have already qualified for the Games. In the Europe, Shirley Robertson, well, she got second place in her World Championships, whilst in the laser class, well, Olympic silver medalist Ben Ainsley. You got a third place in the laser world in Mexico, but only just. Yeah, that's right, it was really close. Yeah, you took it to the wire, but that third place means that you haven't got to come to Weymouth and qualify for the Games. If you had have had to come, you'd have been the absolute favourite, but would there have been a chance of an upset? Yeah, definitely. There always is. In any sport, you can never be certain of victory, uh, especially in sailing. And there's also some other really good laser sailors from the UK, Paul Goodison, Andrew Simpson. Um, so it would have been very tough. So I'm, I'm very relieved. The board sailors reveled in the windy conditions early in the series, but in the men's class, there was no relief for anyone who might have thought they had a chance of upstaging the number one seed, Nick Dempsey. 
Dempsey won seven of his 11 races and was the first sailor to win his class at the 2000 Olympic trials. He wrapped up the series with two races to sail. I think uh, I've won the uh, event overall now um, with two races to spare. So uh, from that aspect, it's really good. But um, I still like to um, maybe get another couple of wins in the last two races. In the women's boards, the number two seed, Helen Cartwright, began to make inroads into Christine Johnston's early series lead. As the fleet racing progressed, the soling match racing got underway. A different branch of the sport, it's two boats at a time and there's no points for second. The six entries raced two round robin series before four went forward to the semis. And although there was some promising new talent in town, Britain's Atlanta 96 fourth place Andy Beadsworth was expected to shine. He did, winning all ten of his first round matches. So it's all going according to plan so far, isn't it? <laughs> uh, almost, yeah. Not quite. But we've won the races, we haven't won all the starts. But I think if we can win some starts, then we'll be in good shape. Who don't you want to meet in the final? Is there anybody we don't want to meet? I don't think so. <laughs> the young Ian Williams won his semi-final 4-2. Could he upstage the more experienced Beadsworth? Well, he had three weeks previously in training. Andy Beadsworth has come here absolutely as a favourite, but can Ian Williams and his team spoil his party? Yeah, well, I'd like to think so. Obviously, they were very strong yesterday, but uh, we've uh, had a little rethink over the night, and we feel that we might be able to beat him, having beaten him in set a few weeks ago. I think we've got a realistic chance. Realistic chance to a dose of realism. As the pair dialed up across the start line of race one, Beadsworth in control. From there, it was a question of keeping a cover on Williams and an eye on his every move. But Williams found a chink in Beadsworth's armour and a narrow gap between the favourite and the committee boat at the start of race two. When the two boats converged halfway up the first beat, it was Williams in the driving seat and he controlled the match. For the first time in the regatta, Andy Beadsworth, Richard Sydenham and Barry Parkin found themselves behind Williams. And as Williams crossed the finishing line to level the score, was this the beginning of a high-profile upset? It certainly was the case in the 470 class. Chris Draper and Dan Newman had led the 470 men's fleet since the third race, while the number one seeds Nick Rogers and Joe Glanfield started well, but could not break clear. Draper and Newman were growing in confidence, Rogers and Glanfield were finding the competition stiffer than they would have liked. Yeah, it's close at the moment. Um, we did a five-race series, basically, at the start of the week, and then we've just had a rest day, and then we've started another six-race series today. Nick was pretty confident that all he had to do was get this one out of the way and then concentrate on the main job in, in hand. Do you think you can spoil the party? Um, I think we could spoil the party and go and do the main job in hand, to be honest. Um, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't go to the games and win a medal. When you go to bed at night in the middle of this regatta, when there's so much at stake, do you sleep? Yeah, yeah, I sleep. I sleep right. Uh, you just are exhausted from it all. Fast, latest generation and new to the games, the 49er class. Five teams had their sights on Sydney and were serious contenders. This one was going to be close. But it appeared that Ian Barker and Simon Hiscox were peaking when it mattered, leading the early part of the 16-race series. Until Paul Brotherton and Mo Gray came on strong. Brotherton started well, but then moved up a gear. This was one he felt he could win. Today was basically crunch day. Billy, if we got let Billy get more than four points in front by the end of today, then it would have been really difficult for us to beat him because people are going to start dropping out. So the ability to get boats between us and him is gone by the end of today. So we had to uh, pull out the stops today. Basically, last night I said to myself, we score them more than five points today, it's over. And uh, we got five points today, a third and two first. In the fin, nobody could touch Ian Percy. The pre-Olympic and European champion lost just one race from 11 and in doing so, made himself an almost certain nomination for Team GB. I'm probably one of uh, 
two favourites and certainly three or four people that are good medal chances. Uh, there's Mateusz, the uh, Polish uh, Olympic gold medalist from 96, and I think me and him would both be joint favourites to, to win in Sydney. Well, it's the final day. In the Finns, Ian Percy is already through. In the men's boards, Nick Dempsey's through. Christine Johnson, well, she's looking good in the women's board with a 19-point cushion. But in three other classes, well, it's neck and neck. In the match racing, well, it's one all in the best of nine final between Williams and Beadsworth. The 470, Rogers and Draper on equal points. And in the 49er, well, Paul Brotherton here leads Ian Barker by two points. And it's going to be tense out there today, Ian. You've got a chase, so you'll be out on the attack, surely. Yeah, we're, we're going to be trying to uh, just get two good results today and just beat ball on the water, fair and square. Um, we've got a bit of breeze forecast um, and we, we're looking forward to that. So I think it'd be a good, good old scrap. And Paul, all week when I've been talking to you about you've been chasing all week, now for the Perth points you're going out ahead and leading. Your concern is obviously pre-start, staying out of trouble with this guy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, We've just got to uh, keep our eyes open and do what we've done all week, you know, which is sell well and go fast. And uh, if we do that, we'll be hard to beat. Christine Johnston left the shore en route to sealing the women's Mistral series. She managed to hold off the light wind challenge of Helen Cartwright. And in the soling match racing, Ian Williams's victory was just a blot on Andy Beadsworth's Olympic landscape. Beadsworth went on to win 5-1. Even so, he didn't seem that delighted. We are hoping to go to the week with no losses at all. It's the only thing we could really aim at. There's nothing much for us to gain here besides losing the trial. It's all loss and no gain. So. Back in the 49er class, and things were going Paul Brotherton and Mowbray's way. In the penultimate race, they arrived at a top mark in third place. Barker and Hiscox were struggling behind in the pack. But then, nightmare for Brotherton and Gray. They made contact with the Budgeon brothers. Penalty turns, lost time. Barker got past. The result of all that? Well, both teams went into the final race on equal points. Walker and Mark Cavell both lost their Olympic helmsmen, John Merricks and Glenn Charles, in tragic accidents. They came together in the star class to avenge their personal losses and in one year have worked their way towards the top of the world rankings. And Ian Walker joins me now. Ian, there's tremendous support for your campaign, but in a very short time you've made a big impact on the world stage. Has that surprised you? Uh, we've been very pleased. We didn't expect to uh, get so competitive so fast. But uh, time's short till Sydney, and uh, we need to be improving at this rate just to catch up with the others, so we're very optimistic. Well, you won a medal last time, and you're a medal prospect this time, but now, look at the 470, the class where you won your medal. Have we realistically got a medal chance there this time? I think when you look at the last Olympics, the guys that won the gold medal had uh, not won any championships before. I think if you're one of the top ten boats, then you're in with a chance, and I think you know we've seen some great sailing by these young teams, and uh, I'm very optimistic that if they could just get in that top ten, then uh, if they have a good week, they too could win a medal. But first, they needed to get through the trials, and the battle continued. Rogers and Glanfield had the edge on Draper and Newman coming off the start line. But a tactical error allowed Draper and Newman through. The favourites were in trouble. In a building breeze and a lumpy sea, number three seeds Draper and Newman never looked back. They went on to win the series. But the result was so close that the selectors elected to send the top three onwards for further trials. Rogers and Glanfield and Draper and Newman were joined by Graham Viles and Magnus Leesk.
After the race, the favourites were reflecting on the defining moment that could have cost them the event. I think the turning point in the race, we, he came across the court and we had to make a decision whether to call Starboard on him or tap to learn. And we felt as though we could tap to learn and pinch him off. And we tap to learn and he managed to get some height and roll us. And, uh, and then that's where it turned and then he was on top of us for the rest of the race. To be honest, I think in the last six months we've learned to work as a team and the reason why I think we've won this event is because the roles are completely shared and we just trust one another so much. Well, in the 470s, Chris Draper has put a brilliant performance into the final race and it appears that he's won the day. But in the 49ers, there was a dramatic penultimate race and Brotherton and Barker go into the final on equal points. In the final race, Barker and Hiscox avoided the carnage to sail into the lead. Behind, Brotherton and Gray were struggling in traffic. And after 16 races of action, drama and incident, Barker and Hiscox won the event by a single point. After four years of build-up to the Games, finishing second in an Olympic trials can be cruel. Brotherton and Gray were feeling the pain. And see Bart all of that. And say, uh... well, first race it was a bit on and we pulled through and overtook Paul and that and so that put us about equal on points I think. And then the next one we had a bit of a ding dong on the start with a bit of match racing going on which we managed to get slightly the better of. Uh, and then it was all just a bit stressful from there on trying to stay in the lead and stay in front, but we did it. Collecting gold from Chernikiv chairman Peter Harrison and winning the regatta was half the story. Well, coming to a regatta as favourite isn't easy. It is if you're Ian Percy. Gold medal, Ian Percy. The BOA announcement that followed was the rest. On behalf of the British Olympic Association, the following sailors are officially selected to represent Great Britain as members of Team GB at the 2000 Games in Sydney later this year. In the Finn class, Ian Percy. In the 49er class, Ian Barker and Simon Hiscox. In the Soling class, Andrew Beatsworth, Barry Parkin and Richard Sydenham. And in the Mistral class for men, Nick Dempsey. These sailors have come through the regatta this week and join Ian Walker and Mark Cavell in the Star class, Ben Ainsley in the Laser class, and Shirley Robertson in the Europe class as the sailing members of Team GB for the 2000 Games in Sydney. The British Olympic Association wishes all of the sailors the best of luck for the Games and we hope that you continue the medal winning tradition that sailing has as a British sport. Thank you. So the big decisions have been made and RYA Olympic manager John Derbyshire are they the right decisions in your mind? Uh, I think they are. I'm delighted. We've, we've tried to put on a world-class event for world-class sailors, and uh, our world-class sailors have come to the top of the tree. And confident about medals? Very confident. It's uh, You will never know until the day, but uh, we've got the best of the best going in there. So, yes, as confident as you can be. And Mark Howe from the BOA. We've got some strong, strong sailors out there, yeah. filing great performances on the international scene, but talk to me about the overall Team GBR. Well, I think this time going to the Games, we've got a very good opportunity to come back with some good medal performances. Atlanta was a disappointment, there's no doubt about that. But if we look at the way that people have performed over the last couple of years on the international scene, across a whole diversity of sports, I think we're going into this Games in good, good shape. And I'm certainly looking forward to us coming back with uh, uh, you know, some really good performances. Well, Atlanta may have been a disappointment, but for the Sailors, well, they got two silver medals and two fourth places. And since then, well, things have just got better and better. So there are great expectations this September in Sydney for the boys behind me.